Um, well, welcome to our second um, Generative AI community meeting. Um, we're really excited. I personally am very excited to have a dear friend of mine, Andrea Wallace, here with us today. Um, and as a very short gift, ask to keep it short, <laughs> simple. So that's what I should do. Um, Dr. Andrea Wallace is an associate professor in law and technology, um, teaching art in law, intellectual property law, internet law, legal foundations, torts, and the cultural heritage digitization lab at the University of Exeter. Um, her research focuses on intersections of art and cultural heritage law with the digital realm and digital heritage management. She's a co-director of the GLAM E Lab, which she'll talk about a little bit more, established in partnership with the Engelberg Center on Innovation in Law and Policy at NYU Law School. And she's also the deputy director of the Center for Science, Culture, and Law at the University of Exeter. And so today, Andrea's here to talk a bit about generative AI and copyright. And thank you. Um, well, I'm super excited to nerd out over this topic. That with I expect to be a lot of interesting interdisciplinary backgrounds um, in the room. And uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm here for the week to do some of the GLAMI work that Simon mentioned. So GLAM stands for Galleries, Libraries, Archives, and Museums. And it's becoming kind of a catch-all term for all the different collection holders that hold some sort of heritage, right? And one of the reasons that I really focus a lot of my research on GLAM institutions is because of the parallels that um, can be drawn between other institutions that hold an incredible amount of power um, and authority in society and the responsibilities that they have to their publics. So I come at this from a very interdisciplinary background myself. I went to art school before law school um, and my PhD was kind of an intersection that um, brought art making into the study of law. So I'm gonna keep it a little high level and try to think about some of the provocations in terms of um, how law really shapes how we understand who gets to be a creator, um, but also some of the questions that are posed around technologies as if they're somehow new um, or as if we haven't encountered them before. And maybe take a little bit of a historical approach to asking this question about who gets to be a creator um, because of how embedded it is within the data that sits within our cultural institutions. Okay. So I'm gonna take you on a little bit of a journey and um, I'll start with a brief introduction to copyright because it's very helpful to think about what it is, where it came from and how it affects or protects us. Uh, another then topic to think about is artificial intelligence. That's why we're all in the room. Um, but how it intersects with copyright are these questions of, you know, are AI generated works protected by copyright? Um, do they infringe on the copyright of other creators and even the creation of AI, right? And the power imbalances in that. <laughs> and then it may seem like a bit of a detour, but I'm gonna take us down this question of how bias intersects with copyright and the public domain um, as it relates to cultural institutions and looking at cultural institutions as data sets themselves, right? And then lastly, we'll think about the policy that underlies copyright law and ask whether it has any answers. Oops, something's going off my computer. Here we go. Whether it has any answers, whether it holds promise, um, or is it all pitfalls from here on out? But first, just to make all of this a little bit less abstract, uh, you may have seen this story that you know hit Twitter and kind of broke the internet for a little while. An AI-generated artwork committed by Jason Allen won the Colorado State Fair. Um, and according to Allen, he used a text to AI image generator, specifically a journey to create hundreds of images, which he then selected three of and upscaled them and then printed them on canvas and submitted them to the digital arts, digitally manipulated photography category for quote, artistic practice that uses digital technology as part of the creative process. And in his submission, he actually explained that he used Midjourney, right? But the people who read it didn't either recognize what it was or understand that it was an image generator in this sense. So at the end, we have him winning this category and inspiring all these controversies around, you know, whether it's art, whether he cheated, 
um, whether the image itself was protected by copyright, and if so, who owned that copyright, whether it was fair that he used Midjourney, um, which itself is trained on the works of other creators for this specific purpose. And I just, I love this here. He says, I'm not gonna apologize for it. <laughs> um, but the question of whether it is art, I don't think is actually very interesting. Um, every time new technologies emerge, people revisit this question, right? And they ask it with respect to whatever it is that feels like it's new, as if it's somehow novel this time around. And um, I'm also not really interested in whether the work has copyright, you know, from a legal perspective. From a policy perspective, I think it's pretty interesting, and we'll touch on that a little bit later. Um, because the answer to that will have follow-on effects for labor markets, for creative markets, right? Um, concentration of additional wealth and power. And so the legal question is not interesting to me, but the policy one is. And um, I think in terms of where the interest really is though, uh, is what it says about the work itself, the data that it's trained on, and um, some of these questions around uh, how it engages with creators of the past, okay? And so um, where we're kind of going with this and what I want us to think about with this talk is how we might look to copyright, but in partnership with other areas and strategies to think about policy making um, to achieve what copyrights policy based goals are claimed to put forward. But in the process, we get to decide what it is that we want, right? We're not bound to these laws or bound to these goals. We can decide what the outcomes are that we want them to be if we want them to be more equitable. Um, because none of this is especially new. Like we are all in this room recombination engines. We had consume content from the other creators. We put it together, um, ideas, conversations, it all becomes part of our creative process. But what is new is the speed with which AI can produce creative works. And um, with such mediocrity, I might add, um, as well as the ways in which AI surfaces the biases in creativity and in copyright that are already there. Because if you were thinking that this imagery or the iconography looked familiar, then you'd be right um, or familiar. So uh, we don't actually know what text to AI images uh, or phrases Alan used to create his work, but it is fairly obvious that he drew on French Orientalist traditions, even in the title of his work, which he called Théâtre d'Opera Spatiale. So in early modern France, artists used both real and imaginary intricate details to kind of invoke foreignness, right? Leading to the Orientalist style where they would bring together and mix different styles of art and architecture from Turkey, Egypt, India, Algeria, and other countries in the region without attention to what those styles actually meant or where they came from. And so Orientalism as a popular aesthetic grew through its dissemination of cultural stereotypes. And um, this was described by Edward Said as the limitations that follow upon disregarding, essentializing, denuding the humanity of another culture, people, or geographical region. So it's unsurprising that like French Orientalism, uh, the outputs of generative AI are recombining meaning without context in order to evoke our aesthetic sensibilities. But what does all this have to do with copyright? Um, because None of these images that it may or may not have been trained on are technically protected by copyright. They were all created so long ago that they themselves are in the public domain, which means they can be fed into data sets. They can be used for AI training and all types of things that lack the context that I just described. So let's begin with a very brief intro to copyright. <laughs> so copyright, the first thing we all do is we go to Wikipedia, right? Whether or not we want to admit it. Um, and it arises automatically, and this is going to be a general statement because copyright's jurisdictional. It'll change from one country to the next with some kind of strong overlaps, which that's what I'm going to be focusing on. So it arises automatically in what we call original content that is expressed in a tangible form the moment that it's created. And original is a very, very low threshold. Um, but this means text, visual works, sound recordings, database content, computer programs, whatever list you have in your phone or on a, you know, the back of a receipt to go to the grocery store will be protected by copyright. Um, and it lasts for the entire lifetime of the author, plus an additional 70 years beyond death. And so that's a very long time. And whoever the rights holder is, maybe it's your heir, maybe it's you specifically, maybe you've assigned it to a company for a lot of money. 
they will enjoy an exclusive monopoly over the term of the copyright um, for reuse of the work. And there are some limitations to that, um, but they can also license the work, okay? And one of the reasons that I picked this image of copyright is because it's written in English, it's on Wikipedia, and so there is a bias in this copyright page for jurisdictions that are English speaking, but also because copyright, or sorry, Wikipedia itself licenses all of its text um, in a way that it can be reused commercially, so long as it is cited as the source and shared alike. So what this means is all the AI technologies that are already out there being trained are totally ingesting everything that's on Wikipedia. So Wikipedia is a huge data set to begin with. Um, but one of the things that we want to think about here is that you know, the general idea uh, in a lot of common law countries like the US and the UK is that people need incentives to create. And so if you offer them the copyright over the things that they've created, they'll be incentivized to create more creative works and in the process be able to support themselves economically. And that then creates more creative works for all of us. We have a greater social and cultural welfare, welfare to surround us. Um, but there are some very different doctrine, doctrines and theories underlying these ideas of copyright because in continental Europe, it's more about your personhood and the fact that you've created something, so you should be entitled to control how it's used. So where did copyright come from? Well, it's always been mixed up with technology. And so we start to see some of the early expressions of the idea of copyright and printing privileges in 15th century Italy. Um, where essentially it was to protect the investment that someone would make in doing something productive, right? So the Venetian Senate or whoever the controlling body was would write a privilege to you that you would be the only person who was entitled to do that thing, okay? With that comes maybe some capacity for corruption or concentration of monopolies and a lot of um, worries uh, that then led us to a different process where we start to think about it needs to be something new in order to receive the monopoly. So we have the first copyright statute in uh, Britain, which really only protected publishers. Um, it expanded to uh, engravings and then photography like decades, decades later, um, as well as the constitution of the United States that tells Congress that they can create laws that promote this uh, the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to inventors and authors the exclusive rights to their respective writings and discoveries. So one thing to keep in mind is at the time that copyright kind of emerged, it lasted for 14 years from the date of publication. And if you remember, like what I said a little bit ago, it's now 70 years after the death of the author. So we have a huge term to be thinking about when we think about how that impacts our ability to access older works and reuse them or even newer works. Um, but if we ask ChatGPT, there we go, what copyright is, it actually brought all of this up. So I made this slide and then I was like, I wonder what ChatGPT says. And it gives like a very high level summary of this kind of development, but it doesn't go into kind of the bigger questions. It's still very much focused on this kind of economic-based system for copyright. So what is the public domain? <clears throat> There's a couple meanings. Sometimes we hear, oh, it's in the public domain. Is that referring to something that is publicly available? Um, but in our sense, we're thinking about the intellectual property of public domain. So what that means is that any rights that would normally restrict it uh, have expired. Another way to think about it is that because something has to justifiably attract a right in order to be protected, it's that everything is in the public domain until we say it's not, right? But we do have things that we look at that will overlap with a lot of the content that generative AI is using. So first of all, um, <clears throat> copyright itself is biased in that it doesn't protect certain types of expressions like traditional knowledge or traditional cultural expressions. It doesn't see them as being original in the copyright sense. But there's also like government work, short phrases, facts, numbers, descriptive data, all these things that can be scraped and adjusted, right? We then have a lot of materials that predate IP laws. So these are creative works that were made before copyright recognized protection in them, as well as faithful reproductions. So digital surrogates, images of those works. And then copyright or uh, works for which IP rights have expired, 
as well as like you as a creator can choose to dedicate your works to the public domain. You don't have to hold on to the copyright and enforce it. So then does that mean everything is copyright infringement? No. And the reason this is important is because we do have exceptions and limitations, but these are also jurisdictional. So that means if you're in the US, you can rely on fair use in terms of how it's defined by US law to do certain things. But if you're in the United Kingdom, you have to look to the concept of fair dealing, or maybe you're in the European Union and now you've got a new directive that allows text and data mining. So when we look at where even some of the organizations are geographically located that are involved in generative AI, we do need to be thinking about the flexibilities that allow them to use in copyright materials as part of the data sets. But you can also just use materials that are not protected by copyright, which means materials that are in the public domain. And given the long term of copyright, that means we have to go back 70 years. So it's anyone who died up to 1952, okay? <clears throat> So, inter-artificial intelligence. Why do we care? Well, it's disrupted everything. Um, even the question of what is copying, right? We're looking at what does it mean for a machine to observe things and be trained off of them if there's no specific act of copying in the process that we can identify for the purpose of copyright infringement. And so one of the questions that, um, one of the reasons I find this question less interesting, and I would say, a lot of people do is that it's since 1986, since even before then, been a question that legal scholars have been looking to. So the way that we kind of break this down is we think, okay, is there any human input that is involved in um, the assistance of a computer generated work from the human? And if so, maybe we'll recognize copyright protection. But where it's purely generated by AI, that's where we start to think no, because it's not a human creator, right? It's not a person with legal capacity who can enforce the copyright, um, who can sue someone. And it's not like, you know, the, the incentives of copyright then go unrewarded because the person who invented that thing still gets a patent in it or a copyright in the software code, just not in the outputs that it creates. But all of these things are really coming to the surface at the moment when we think about how generative AI may or may not infringe copyright when it uses data that is copyright protected. <clears throat> so we have a few artists that of course have brought a lawsuit against Stability AI, Midjourney and DeviantArt, and <clears throat> a few other lawsuits. Maybe you've heard about Getty Images suing Stability AI for downloading like 12 million of their images and creating a uh, data set for that for training. We also have um, a GitHub case that looks at software. So not visual art, but also open AI and meta lawsuits. Um, that are based on books that were ingested, and then some with privacy issues. So it's not just a copyright question that we're essentially interested in here, because there's also some double standards that we're seeing emerge in the process. So Getty AI is suing, saying, oh, you're using all of our images that we have paid people to use, that we have created this huge website for, and have Um, systems on the images that they have within their own system. And so here the CEO of Getty Images says, we're excited to launch a tool that harnesses the power of generative AI to address our customers' commercials needs while respecting the intellectual property of creators. But what's happening is these licenses that people have signed or the contracts that they've signed um, are being interpreted to expand to new technologies, right? Um, and sometimes we can't potentially foresee the different ways in which someone might be using some of our works. But this is when, you know, the centralization of this sort of content becomes really incredibly um, uh, valuable for companies who are engaging in this. The same uh, applies to Photoshop. And, you know, the CEO of Photoshop or CTO, he says, I don't think AI is going to displace creative professionals, but I will think that you'll see a disruption between the people who figure out how to adopt it well and those who don't, right? And um, what's really interesting is these companies are touching on the underlying concern of bias in data sets. And they're saying, we're taking all these steps to make sure that, you know, it is commercially unbiased or it's protected or it's not going to reproduce harm. And um, you'll also see this word innovation in the background, which is like a huge flag that's often used, especially by governments in terms of really promoting IP focused policies. Um, 
And so, you know, we start to think, well, some of these questions have, have always emerged. We've always had professional photographers um, who, in this instance, are now competing with people who have really high quality uh, technologies on their phone so that users can take their own photographs and maybe not need professional photographers as much. Um, and so we start to see some of these things shift and take a little bit of a different form, but not necessarily present anything novel or new. So this brings us to kind of these underlying questions of bias and this, um, this movement of open glam, okay? And so I wanna think about this as it applies to our cultural institutions and the open glam movement, um, which is essentially just lots of collection holders coming together and publishing their collections in ways that allow anyone to reuse them for any purpose. Because one of the reasons is that if these lawsuits that we're seeing emerge kind of come to some conclusion that make people step back a little bit from using in copyright materials, which I don't know the answer, right? It is going to exacerbate the, diet, the bias that we see in data sets because of the length of copyright. And so we're gonna see some shifts to using public domain data and information that's available online. So I wanna peel back some of the layers and think about like what makes this risky. Um, because it's not just about the histories of collecting and knowledge production, who could be a creator, but also why images are very different from text-based data when it comes to bias and controlling bias in the data. So how these practices have kind of currently shaped um, the demographics of the digital public domain relates to historical biases. And these relate to who could be an author. Um, it was often women were excluded, people of color, things that relate to colonial conquest or even bilateral treaties around who could even hold property, right? The types of creative expressions that we see. Um, because copyright emerged from a system that really prioritized what we would see as the fine arts that excluded antiquity, you know, craft, things that were also creative expressions of people who were normally excluded from even the arts educational systems and for participating in salons or having their works collected. Um, so all of this then feeds into the cultural institution as a biased data set to begin with, but it also maps onto how copyright law became a global international regime. And that of course is through histories of colonization, um, through histories of taking land and then applying the laws of the nation to that land. While meanwhile, we have a history of um, European treaties being signed and even cross Atlantic treaties being signed where um, people are respecting uh, the rights of the authors from those European countries and really starting to harmonize and come up with international regimes that create a specific value system for everyone else who then falls under those laws. So this means when we think about how does this materialize in contemporary law, how do new laws replicate these biases? Well, it feels like these biases are now transplant or transparent um, because its broader impact has really been to normalize like the history of these things in a way that makes it more difficult to see how it applies. So this is a new EU directive that um, we, maybe you know about this, maybe you've tried to contact an institution before and you've tried to use an artwork that's 200 years old and they tell you, well, in order to use that, you're gonna to have to pay me a fee. And you're like, but wait, there's no copyright in that image. Well, what's happening is you're claiming copyright in the photograph, okay? And the photograph is essentially a copy of the underlying painting and it's becoming more and more controversial. So this was the European Commission's response. They said, we're going to put into one of our digital single market directives, a specific article that says no more of this. For works of visual art in the public domain, when you reproduce it, it can't be subject to new rights, okay? It needs to stay in the public domain. But you might notice that it only applies to works of visual art. So these, again, are gonna be those types of expressions that I referenced that are typically made by European men. Um, and it means that if we interpret this narrowly, institutions will still be able to claim copyright and all of the images that they create that don't fall within the customary meaning of visual art. And so it also means that when we kind of apply this to collecting practices and the types of works, right, that people will have within institutions, there's generally less data around these types of works as well, because those value systems will shape what the collector is collecting around them. So here we have woman's apron, right? This would be a craft 
we also have objects that would be deemed as ethnographic materials, not sculptures, right? Um, antiquities. And so these would be the types of materials that would fall outside of Article 14 and institutions would be able to still continue claiming copyright. While meanwhile, we will have collections that essentially the 2D paintings that we've been talking about, if they're digitized and published online, they have to be made available as public domain. And the biases that are in the collection then get exported to the digital collection. So one example is the National Gallery in London. There's more than 2,300 2, artworks in their collection, 21 are by women. So we're gonna be seeing these biases that are already in collections exported to the public domain. And again, it's really nothing new, right? We have all of these kind of creative interventions going back to um, the Gorilla Girls, going to the Met Museum, asking, does a woman have to be naked to get into the Met Museum because of the demographic of artists that are actually collected and presented on the walls. So when we start to think about um, studies that are looking at innovative and critical ways to uh, re-examine the collection as something that can be um, uh, a data set in of itself, we also need to ask about the different histories and um, the cataloging systems that exist around them and the biases that are embedded in those as well, right? Because it's not just the images, it's not the knowledge, it's also the data structures and it's how they were created and how they were collected in the first place that then get embedded in the data systems. And because of these situated selection processes, they then get trans, um, transferred into technology systems and presented on the front end with infrastructures that become literally empirical evidence about what was important to collect, document, and record around a given culture. And copyright itself can be incredibly violent when we look at specific um, collection types, right? So this is an ancestor who has been digitized. And when we look at the information that is recorded around it, um, this specifically says exactly how they were excavated, right? Who they were donated by. And these data sets, the systems then become um, normalized within entire collections, right? That get openly licensed and made available um, for different research in and of itself being a property claim that allows them to commercialize the image. So we then see lots of research starting to kind of replicate the bias in and of the public domain. And maybe you saw this paper that came out a couple of years ago on trustworthiness, where the scientists argued that they had tra uh, tracked historical changes using machine learning analyses of facial cues and paintings. And I think any person who's ever taken any art class or gone to art school would be like, you see something and what you end up painting is never what you think you're actually painting, right? regardless of how good you might be, but the, the issue being that these are not um, photographic representations, right? There are different artistic trends that would have existed all across this portraiture that doesn't get embedded in the context of how it then gets studied um, and uh, built into AI systems or machine learning or different types of analyses that tell us something um, that we would, would otherwise have not known. And so all of this is exacerbated by copyright and due to collecting practices, which I just explained. Um, but one of the, the arguments that's out there is that we really do need copyright exceptions in order to allow us to ingest more recent works into data sets for, um, for shaking up the demographic of data, right? And there's other ways around this, of course, but um, one of which would be publishing things under open licenses and dedicating things to the public domain yourself. But when we think about, again, going back to these kind of very jurisdiction specific exceptions, fair use is a US exception. So the companies in the US will be able to use fair use, whereas companies outside of the US will not. So these jurisdiction specific exceptions may not be the answer, they can help, but they're also going to uh, effectively allow certain uh, companies to, to do things that other companies wouldn't be able to do, which then could also shape the outputs. So what does open glam look like? One of the reasons we don't wanna rely on this is because there's a lot of bias in open glam itself. So this is um, a spreadsheet that I uh, work on with a colleague Douglas McCarthy. And we try to track every instance of an institution publishing anywhere from one to 
5 million images, which is this most Smithsonian institution, under um, open licenses or public domain tools that allow anyone to reuse them. And so we have actually this number has grown recently, um, but it's more than 1600 institutions across 55 countries. And it's more than 95 million assets that can be used, right? What this actually represents is less than 1% of cultural institutions globally. And if you map them, you see that 87% are in the US, the EU and the UK. And they account for 85 million of the digital assets that are available. So not only does this mean this data is being published in English, right, by institutions that have been developing knowledge around works that are produced within their own kind of cultures, but also works that are produced outside of their cultures. And all uh, countries that have kind of very developed histories of colonization and imperialism. So we have a global minority that is publishing data about a global majority that then shapes all the technologies that are trained on it. And so this is something that an organization called Whose Knowledge is looking at. And um, they're really interested in how they create a global campaign to recenter the global majority on the internet and the knowledge of the global majority, different languages, the ways in which the knowledge is produced because it's primarily written if it's on the internet. So what knowledge are we missing if the knowledge is oral or expressed in another form? Um, and you'll see that what some of the stats that they talk about here are also about um, the perspectives that then get included even on Wikipedia, right? When we think about like what online knowledge looks like and that being available to be trained, um, it's very underrepresentative. And um, there's something that we need to be thinking about in context in and of itself if we're, if we're training data on this or training AI on it. But another bias that comes through is specifically related to this history of like commercializing collections, right? So if you have your entire existence, taken photographs, sold them in the gift shop, put them on postcards, um, licensed the images for people who want to do research, that's going to replicate, right, a certain canon in terms of what people are interested in. And then when you decide to go open access and you have images that are part of a digital collection that represent that viewpoint of what's important to digitize in your collection, and you publish it online, you're gonna have a very specific idea of what is important about your collection. What are the highlights? What are the masterpieces, right? That then start to be ingested into different um, data sets. But these things already exist in analog form, okay? So maybe you saw this uh, collaboration from Jeff Koons and Louis Vuitton a few years ago where, uh, he created a line of bags inspired by the great masters. And um, in a press release, uh, the collaboration boasted this attempt to, quote, erase the hierarchy by, quote, generating appreciation for classical works by bringing them to a contemporary audience. And um, the power imbalances in the capital and re uh, the reputation that's required to even get institutions on board with a project like this um, is, you know, is not unlike that that's required to do tech things in the institution. And so then the question becomes, of course, how much to the masses are these, these works being delivered, but also the specific narrative that gets generated by um, what is selected for them. So we have, uh, a set of products for women, the representation of women across the board, um, they're either nude or, you know, the ultimate femme fatale slash Madonna. And um, the one woman of color who's represented is, of course, one of the, um, the children uh, that Gauguin painted regularly um, with his very problematic history uh, in uh, French uh, Polynesia. So, then we look at, of course, the new things that are happening within institutions. Not a lot of people will have the type of access that big inst or big organizations will have to go in and really shake up the collection and ask new, new questions. And the questions themselves are not entirely new. So um, maybe you saw the next Rembrandt, which was a collaboration uh, with the Rijksmuseum and a bunch of other institutions where they basically fed a lot of Rembrandt's portraits into um, a machine learning technology that then told us what the next Rembrandt would have been, 
but like why Rembrandt, right? And a lot of money goes into these programs that then could be spent on maybe digitizing things or looking at different questions that actually contribute to a better understanding um, of, of what our cultural values are. So this really comes down to um, some of the, the, the commentary around digital colonialism, and especially these questions of like hyper canonization that are occurring through digital technologies, um, making collections machine actionable, and even the biases that we all engage with when we start to ask questions um, about specific uh, stories in the, in the art. <clears throat> and that brings us back to, you know, this example, because when, the average person will engage with the mid journey or other uh, image generator, that context will be completely absent, right? So the question then becomes what gets replicated and what context is lost. And one last example, maybe you saw this um, even in person because it's at MoMA. Let me see if I can, here we go. is uh, Refik Anadol's, it's a data-driven artwork that's called Unsupervised. And so he ingested all of MoMA's digital collection of more than 200 years of art um, and created and minted digital abstractions to sell as NFTs, for which MoMA is receiving 17% of all primary sales and 5% of secondary sales from the series. But you know, the question is um, cool. It's, it's great to look at, right? It's aesthetic. But well, what are the impacts of engaging in this type of work, right? Like, just because we have the technologies, is it actually telling us anything new? Um, is it valuable for us to invest our time in asking these questions? And I don't necessarily know the answer to that, but I do know that um, these questions about who benefits from it, you know, and um, the studies that are showing how computational heavy um, artworks are using enough energy to run small countries, even um, NFTs, where the data centers are located. All of these things that require water from cooling. Um, they're often in places where water is also scarce. So how do we bridge the gap between digital and environmental ecosystems to imagine more connected and international futures? Um, and does copyright have anything to do with that? So this is where we get to the last bit. And um, copyright, you know, it can't fix everything. And it's actually supposed to be very narrowly focused on incentives and the connection between the artist and their work. Um, but it is interested also in labor, you know, both creative and manual labor and rewarding labor and innovation. Um, and so this is where we start to get some of the interesting questions because what are gonna be some of the follow on impacts when we think about creative industries and the market for creative works going forward? You know, these are some of the questions that um, I think then lead us to ask what are gonna be the barriers that arise for small tech companies with limited resources who wanna engage in AI? Because if some of the outcomes of these copyright lawsuits are that when you start licensing from artists, then it's gonna have some follow on impacts about who can enter those spaces and develop technologies. Um, what well, is gonna be the impact for consumers, right? In terms of competition, diversity in AI technologies, the outputs that they produce, and so why we may, may not have all the answers to this, um, this is where policy starts to come in. One of the things that copyright can't do, of course, is um, what we're thinking about in terms of risk. And a lot of the movement that's happening on national levels, both in the EU and the US, around risk assessment in, in technology. So whatever we think about, um, it does need to be uh, very much complemented by, by other types um, of safeguards in other areas of law and even technology. But what we can think about are the inverse of the incentives. If we want to incentivize certain activity by not recognizing copyright or not recognizing copyright protections, might it disincentivize that activity? We also see, of course, um, these claims that artificially intelligent painters are inventing new styles of art. But we know that that's not true because AI produces predictive creativity, right? And we also know that because the models start to collapse on each other through feedback loops um, when they then are trained on AI generated works. So there are safeguards that are already built into copyright and even patent law where we're only recognizing protections for natural persons. Um, and part of that is, you know, logistical, but also policy. 
So we can't think about actually effective enforcement systems where we have people who are concentrating power through maybe machines as employees in terms of enforcing copyright. You know, they can't be hired. They can't sign contracts. We don't have the exchange of um, benefit and value that typically occurs when a contract is signed. But also machines don't need incentives to create, right? If you just go back to straight copyright rules, maybe it's already there. But there's also regulation in terms of tech design, like designing technology to um, to protect artists from style mimicry or even technology regulation, taxes. When did those stop being a thing, right? Um, licensing and other questions. And so um, this book by Jessica Silby, Against Progress, she goes through kind of these questions uh, with respect to photographers and the way that it has changed the industry, um, the policy questions you know, that need to be answered or resolved and really asking like, what are our fundamental values? And, and when did people stop being the focus and the public interest stop being the focus of copyright? Um, and how can we rebalance that to, to kind of pull back from all of like, the economic, economic uh, focus that, that it is kind of turned into. But I think there's some really fun questions <laughs> that come out of this when we start to think about, well, wait a second, which labor markets do we maybe want to um, uh, co-opt when we're, you know, what's the end goal? And so this article really made me laugh. Um, but we also have uh, what we see is, you know, the power and the concentration of power um, starting to develop uh, within certain companies as well. And um, the ability to purchase talent, right, the ability to bring people in um, is incredibly important, but it also is a completely inequitable system of whose labor gets rewarded. Um, because in Hito Sterl's uh, recent paper, you know, she really goes into the detail of like these images, the labor markets. Um, she talks about the statistical images of AI, what they're producing, and even the political economy of the image itself um, in terms of whose labor gets rewarded, right? Whose labor is required to clean the data in order to support these systems um, and whose labor actually uh, gets compensated and is rewarded through power. And so I guess the end of this is that I'm not so sure that legal frameworks are the answer. And what we're seeing is a lot of um, localization in terms of carving out space where we don't allow the dominant systems to apply. And um, this also, you know, it impacts this question of who gets to be a creator, but also who gets to design copyright law or who gets to have a say in shaping some of these answers, because there's been a lot of historical disenfranchisement in the system to begin with. Um, so with that, I'm not gonna give you any answers. I'm just gonna say thank you. <laughs> and um, yeah, let's have a conversation. Let's